While women may use it, there's a whole population of men who will actually tell women to use it more and more and more because they don't want to look after their own protection. What we have today is completely different from that period. Interestingly, if we went back a century, women almost never menstruated. There are so many patients who come to us with this fear. I had an IUD, it was kept in longer than the doctor told me. The vaginal pH is always acidic. Mm -hmm. And to maintain a reasonably acidic pH, some women need to use a vaginal wash, which they can. So why are a lot of young girls reaching puberty way before their time today? If any woman is even dreaming of a pregnancy anytime in the future, getting onto folic acid is one of the best ways of preventing birth defects. Welcome to the Lucatino Show, where we can learn to reimagine our lifestyle. Dr. Nazar, pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Luke. Second time on Reimagine Your Lifestyle. The first episode was just mind-blowing. And I'll tell you why. We had so many people, so many women who were confused, who were lost, who heard this amazing podcast and your advice and have actually messaged back talking about how life-changing it is. The simplicity that you left us with, the, the wisdom that's come with your practice, it's just been phenomenal. And I know right after we finished recording that, we said we'll do an episode two. And here you are today amidst your busy schedule. So it's a pleasure and honor to have you again, doctor. Thank you so much. Privileged. And I can tell you that I get a lot of feedback from my patients. And I've never had as much feedback as I did <laughs> after that episode with you. So I can tell you, you've got a great following, not just in India, but all over the world. I've Thank never you. had so many people calling in and telling me how great that episode was. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. And I know we didn't have much time to finish. There are so many questions that people have a right to know about because there's also so much of confusion on social media today. So uh, I want to start off today talking about oral contraceptives. You know, a brief on how does this actually work in the body? You know, and I'll tell you where I'm coming from. While women may use it, there's a whole population of men who will actually tell women to use it more and more and more because they don't want to look after their own protection. And there are side effects at some point if a woman is doing this without knowledge and at the right time. So I would love for you to talk a little bit about oral contraceptives, how it works, the different kinds that exist and things that we should look out for if we are using these oral contraceptives. Uh, so the oral contraceptive pill, uh, it was invented in the 1950s and came into its own in the 1960s. What we have today is completely different from that pill. And uh, to a small extent, the stigma with the pill is the stigma that dates back to the 60s and 70s. The Economist uh, in 2000 said the oral contraceptive pill was probably the greatest invention of that century. And it kind of gave autonomy to women. It gave uh, the power of deciding pregnancies or no pregnancies to women. And interestingly, that was around the time when families went from being very large to what, what women wanted. Never before in human history has a medication been taken by so many healthy human beings as the, I'll call it hormonal contraception. Mm -hmm. I won't just limit it to the pill. So that's the background, 100 million women taking it. And that's why we need to have a better understanding and put it in a certain place in women's lives. Presently, we are on the fourth generation of the pill. The first generation is no longer used. We still have the second, third and fourth generations. And I love the fact that I have the choice of selecting from three different generations because I can match a woman to her pill. The latest pill has, so a pill has two hormones, estrogen and progesterone. The hormone, the feminine hormone, estrogen and progesterone, which is technically the hormone of pregnancy. And it basically works by being in the body at the constant level and by telling the ovaries, don't work, I'm taking care of her for you. Mm -hmm. Which is why it's used for balancing so many hormonal issues. Uh, people ask, the first question is, is it safe? Will it cause cancers? And my answer to them is, uh, the pill is extremely safe. 
but some women are dangerous. <laughs> so it's extremely important to find out if you are the right person, person. for the right. thing. Mm-hmm. So if you're someone who has severe migraine, if you're a heavy smoker, if you're a very long-standing diabetic, if you are someone who's uh, very obese, if you're someone who has a very sedentary life, then maybe you should be looking at another method mm-hmm. other than the combined hormonal pill. Now, the great thing about the pill is that today, while it's doing great work for birth control and contraception, uh, it is also giving us a lot of non-contraceptive benefits. And the non-contraceptive benefits of the pill are, again, you know, both of us look after women for many different issues. Mm -hmm. So birth control is one aspect. And a lot of women today and girls today are on the pill, not for birth control, but for the other benefits, cosmetic. Mm-hmm. particularly if there's an excess male hormone, more androgens coming from the ovary, uh, regularization of menstrual cycles. If I'm dealing with a young girl or a woman with PCOS, mm-hmm. with very irregular cycles, which has certain risks of its own. And interestingly, it reduces ovarian cysts. It reduces a condition called endometriosis, which is becoming rampant today mm-hmm. because of women not having that many pregnancies and menstruating regularly, chocolate cysts, and yes, even ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. It actually reduces this. Concerns about breast cancer, I wouldn't use it in a woman who's got a very strong family history Mm -hmm. or past history, but otherwise those concerns are not not really founded. So then uh, the pill has a great place, but it has a place if the woman feels that she wants to be on something and she is motivated enough to do it well. Mm -hmm. My problem with the pill is compliance. Mm -hmm. Human beings make mistakes. Human beings forget pills. And then we have an issue. If it's taken well, it's 99% effective. If it's not taken well, it's less. My problem with the pill, and you very correctly mentioned that, uh, uh, you know, very often the whole onus of Reproductive protection is shifted to the woman mm-hmm. by the man or by the by the way they do things. Yeah. The pill is great for preventing pregnancy. It's not at all useful in preventing infections. Mm. And that's where barrier contraception comes in. So unless the woman is in a very stable, trusted relationship, I will tell her, please use the pill, mm-hmm. but make sure you also use barriers. Yeah. And I'll tell your audience today what I normally tell my patients. If you're on the pill, it's best you don't tell the partner you're on the pill because he'll try and get out of using what protection you should both be doing. That's not so smart. Dual order, protection. Yeah. Now, okay. for women who don't do well with the oral contraceptive pill, today we have progestrogen-only pills. Mm-hmm. They were there. They were not as effective, but the newer progestrogen-only pills are fabulous. They are given continuously. Their side effects is they could disrupt menstruation a little bit. Okay. You could also have injectable, same the project. So the whole concept of modern contraceptive is shifting more and more to progesterone. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, if we went back a century, women almost never menstruated. Wow. So I always say menstruation is a very recent phenomenon wow. in human history. A woman thinks I need to menstruate regularly to be healthy. Well, quite the opposite. Mm. When our grandparents and their parents had 10 and 12 kids, and trust me, all of us know that in our families, a woman spent her entire life being pregnant or breastfeeding. Mm. There was a study, Malcolm Gladwell has written his book about a study done in a tribe in Africa And this researcher went there and he kind of, you know, women used to go into a hut when they were menstruating. And he found back then women menstruated 40 times in their entire life. Today, 400 times. So what's more healthy? Mm. That's where progesterone comes in. Injectables, Mm -hmm. implants, the progesterone only pill and an intrauterine device which releases progesterone in the uterus. Mm -hmm. We can do the same with the birth control pill. Mm -hmm. Today, I can give extended birth control pills and a lot of my patients are empowered and told, you don't want to menstruate every month. As long as you're on the pill, you can use the pill to that advantage and they will take it for 42 days instead of 21. The US FDA has actually approved a system called Seasonal, 
where a woman takes the pill for 83 days and takes a seven day break. So she menstruates once every season, spring, summer, autumn, winter, four wow. times a year. So what I want to stress here is that women need to understand this better for themselves. Women need to work with their healthcare providers. Women need to understand that we've got a variety of different pills which I need to match mm -hmm. to what your needs are and which can make it extremely safe for you. And also understand that this is not your only option. Mm -hmm. It's a great option, but not your only option. And particularly if you're going long term and uh, we decide that, okay, I'm done with my first child. I'm going to wait for three or four years or I'm done with my family and now I don't want any more children. You can go for LAC, which is long acting reversible contraception, which is the IUD. Mm -hmm. The IUD is of two types, copper, where it does nothing to your hormones. It just sits there and protects you. And the hormone releasing IUD, which makes your bleeding 90% less, mm -hmm. sometimes stops your periods. And interestingly, by doing this, it also reduces uterine cancer. Wow, it's amazing that you say that because there are so many, so many patients who come to us with this fear that, hey, I had an IUD. It was kept in longer than the doctor told me. And today I have an ER positive breast cancer or oh. an endometrial and they link it <laughs> with that. So I, I would love for you to shatter that myth. So yeah. firstly, an IUD has a recommended life. Mm -hmm. And most of the IUDs today would be five years. Mm -hmm. And we've got a copper IUD for 10 years. Now okay. the fiber IUD is usually a copper IUD or the hormonal IUD. Mm -hmm. uh, you can always extend their use. I usually extend it by two years. See the idea okay. of extending it is not because you want to save money, but because every time she changes an IUD, she's got, got to go through the adjustment process. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens if an IUD stays behind? Nothing right. happens. Mm -hmm. It's an inert foreign body in your uterus. Sometimes women forget they had it inserted and they come to us for something else. Mm -hmm. Have an ultrasound or I have a woman who comes say with postmenopausal bleeding and on occasion we've removed something called the forgotten IUD. Mm -hmm. I can promise you that that IUD is going to be sitting there like an inert piece of plastic in your Inactive. body and mm -hmm. do nothing for you. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't happen, but that sometimes does. Uh, the IUD has the advantage over the other methods I mentioned mm -hmm. because it is not user dependent. Mm -hmm. It's there. Yeah. You don't need to use anything. You don't need to remember. You don't need to time it. You don't have a, something you take every day or every time you have sex. It's there protecting you. Mm -hmm. But again, the same disadvantage of the pill it doesn't protect you from infections. Mm -hmm. If anything, the copper IUD in a woman who's at high risk of pelvic inflammatory disease, thankfully, we don't see a lot of it in our mm -hmm. population, but in the West, particularly with promiscuity, when there, where there's more PID, the IUD could be a problem. Mm -hmm. So I again, underline the fact that women should be smart, couples should be smart, and uh, they should understand that you have a contraceptive for preventing pregnancy and you have a contraceptive for preventing infection. And I have a large number of young college students coming back, mm -hmm. particularly from the West. Uh, sometimes it's difficult. And again, I'm telling your, your, your viewers today, if you are a mother and you have a, you have a young girl who is in college, Please be open enough to have this conversation with a doctor. And to the young girls, please have the confidence of speaking to someone so you get the best possible advice. And for God's sake, make sure you protect yourself. Because if you don't, mm -hmm. an infection like herpes or HPV could be something you'll have for the rest of your life. And it's completely yeah. preventable. Doctor, is there an age limit? for a girl to start an oral contraceptive or even have an IUD? So firstly, <clears throat> let's talk about oral contraception first. I won't call it oral contraception. I'll call it uh, the combined hormonal con mm -hmm. hormonal pill. Let's mm -hmm. take contraception. Because the moment I take contraception into that name, when I prescribe it to a young girl for something else, the mother's yeah. all freaked out. Got it. Yeah. Uh, I would prefer... To delay there's no age mm -hmm. but I could have a girl as young as 12 and 13 and 14 
who is battling very heavy and abnormal periods mm -hmm. and I need to do something to control them because in adolescence sometimes it takes some time for your periods to regularize mm -hmm. and I could just use progesterone but I would be okay in selected cases to use the oral contraceptive pill or combined hormonal pill. All right. Uh, prefer to delay it but I would use it without hesitation. Now that subgroup of PCOS, the irregular periods, no periods, the significant abnormal hair growth on the face, hair loss, that group will particularly be helped with the pill and we prefer the fourth generation pill because it works very well for these young girls. IUD, interesting. At one point, we thought and a lot of people still believe that you can't use an IUD for a woman who hasn't had a first child mm -hmm. and for a young girl. That myth is not true at all. Wow. The WHO has very clearly said that a young girl can have an IUD, can have an implant, can Got have it. whatever. Mm -hmm. The only thing we have to keep in mind, one, is it's more difficult for the insertion to happen. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I keep coming back to that. It doesn't give me infection protection. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Do you think there's anything coming up for men? Like women have to do <laughs> most of the I stuff. Wish, I wish and, there was because this is yeah. one question women often challenge me with and say, why isn't there more stuff for them? Yeah. Let me say, not for the want of trying. Mm. Uh, see, the big difference between the physiology is for a woman. I've got a menstrual cycle of 28 to 30 days, mm. which I can manipulate and control very easily. Mm. And next month, she's back to normal. Men don't have a cycle such as this. Yeah. They are constantly producing millions of sperms. Mm. And a lot of medications like the pill were tried in men. And unfortunately, either they didn't give us predictable because I have to have zero sperms. Yeah. And it either didn't happen or when it did, it had such a severe side effect that mm. reversible uh, effects didn't happen. So there was, and it also brought down the androgen levels. Mm. So that didn't really work out. There's still work happening there. We tried the vaccine for men. So as of now, for men, there's just two things. Presently, we have the, the, the condom, the barrier. Mm -hmm. We even tried an intravasal device, like you had an intrauterine device. Mm -hmm. Didn't work. So you have barrier contraception mm -hmm. protection, uh, which is something that's extremely important. And mm -hmm. I think every couple should definitely keep this yeah. in mind. And the second is a permanent method, and that's a vasectomy, vasectomy which yeah. unfortunately is not performed as much as it should be mm -hmm. and the onus of even the permanent method has completely shifted to women. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you, I have nothing but admiration mm -hmm. for couples where, where the partner, the male partner, the husband steps up and says, you know, yeah. I think she's done enough this time. It's going to be my turn. Now, I'd love to build up on that point. So, uh, I mean, our audience can learn from there. So for a man now who wants to do this procedure, Okay, are there any side effects for the man? Is it painful? Is it, you know, I mean, these are the basic questions because amazing, I'm sure a amazing. lot of men would want to do it so, and I want so, to encourage so, that. So firstly, yeah. thanks to long-acting reversible contraception, mm -hmm. we're not doing as many permanent methods mm. as we used to. Though I must say in India, the permanent method is still the most commonly performed method. For the man today, there has been a development. There's something mm -hmm. called as non-scalpel vasectomy. Okay. Where a skilled doctor... They don't even really use a knife to cut. Mm -hmm. Local anesthesia, mm -hmm. a small puncture in the scrotum, pick out the vas and tie it off. Mm -hmm. And the amazing thing about this procedure is, since you're doing nothing to the testes, mm -hmm. it doesn't affect your hormones one bit. Mm -hmm. So this fear about, will he be less potent? Mm -hmm. Absolutely unfounded. The only thing about a vasectomy is unlike a tubectomy, which we do in a woman when we tie the mm -hmm. tubes, a tubectomy is immediately effective mm -hmm. because it stops the sperm from eating yeah. the egg. Mm -hmm. In the male, we would have to wait for some time and a certain number of ejaculations for him to be now safe. Got it. Because there'll always be some sperms which are beyond my sight where I've interrupted the vas. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it's a fabulous procedure. It's an outpatient procedure. It's amazing. It's a lot easier than what women have to go through mm -hmm. because they've got to undergo a laparoscopy and and, yeah. and, and the tubes are tied. So it's something I think uh, mm -hmm. men sh couples should keep in mind 
as an option when they are sure their family is complete. Thanks for sharing that. But again, like you uh, keep reminding us, it doesn't take care of infection, it right? So if a man is going to have multiple partners, he will still have to use a barrier protection. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thanks for reiterating that. Doctor, I wanted to move straight into puberty since you brought that up. But before that, what about emergency contraceptives? You know, a lot of women, they, they call up, hey, Luke, I'm going on a holiday. I want to wear a swimsuit or, or, or genuine things. I'm getting married, but my period cycle is going to fall on this particular day. Is it safe for them to do an emergency contraceptive? Is there a, is there a good way of doing it? Something that they, you know, they're eventually yeah. going to do it irrespective. Is there so, a better way of doing so it? So firstly, emergency contraception is for emergencies. Mm. Emergency mm. contraception was never, ever meant to be a primary contraceptive. Beautiful. So my recommendation is please use something that's more dependable. Yeah. But I'm all for emergency contraception when it is needed. Now, when would it mm -hmm. be needed? It would be needed when a couple has had sex which was not expected. Mm. They had nothing at hand. Yeah. When they were using something and that let them down, like a condom breaking. Mm. When, let's face it, someone feels that I'm not sure I need to be safe they use something like a withdrawal and they still need. That's yeah. when you use emergency contraception. Now, about 15 or 20 years ago, I don't know if, if, if our viewers remember, there was a fabulous ad campaign which spoke about emergency contraception. And suddenly the whole country was talking about emergency contraception. I thought that was the best thing that happened. And then there were certain side effects. Mm. We had a government meeting when I was asked to speak and I said, I'm going to speak on side effects. And um, it was I, I spoke on the misuse of emergency contraception. Mm -hmm. And my opening slide was emergency contraception cannot be misused. Mm -hmm. It's great when it serves a purpose. Now, the side effect of emergency contraception, like the people who reach out to you and say they're going to do it, yeah. it will disrupt their menstrual cycles. Mm -hmm. Not harmful, but mm -hmm. it will disrupt their menstrual cycles. In fact, today, if I have a patient come to me with a disrupted menstrual cycle, I'll ask, have you by any chance taken emergency contraception more than once? And they might have, mm -hmm. which is fine. I have no problem with it. But this is a great entry point to get them onto reliable, dependable contraception. Okay. So probably what I would tell the woman is, you know, what you're doing is fine. But I think what you should be doing is get onto the pill. Yeah. And with the pill, if I start, I can do a quick start. I don't have to do it at a certain point in mm -hmm. the cycle. Now, why is emergency contraception not great as a primary contraceptive? So basically, emergency contraception will prevent about 80% of pregnancies. Mm. Whereas the others will prevent 99% over a year. This will prevent 80% over a month. Mm. Now, if the woman has a 15% chance of a pregnancy in a month, that's 2% in a month. Yeah, I always say it's like the interest you pay on credit cards you know how crazy how crazily it builds up two mm -hmm. percent a month is 24 percent in a year yeah, yeah, whereas the other one gives me a one percent failure this gives me a 24 percent failure so for god's sake totally safe please use it if you have to and you are in a fix and there's an emergency but do not depend upon this to be your primary method of contraception so, doctor, I want to bring this out again because we have a lot of young girls and they speak to us sometimes without their parents. OK, and they come and say, hey, Luke, you know, I've, I've gotten into a relationship right now. I meet my boyfriend once in a way and stuff like that. I usually take the pill after we've had sex within 48 hours or 72 hours and stuff like that. Is the right advice to tell them? to explore contraceptive methods over the emergency, like speak to someone like yourself or whoever who will be able, an expert, a professional, who will be able to guide them that if this is going to be my life, I'm traveling from place to place, meeting my boyfriend, we're traveling, it's never all planned and I always end up taking the emergency. So there is advice for them to get onto a more permanent pill where they can avoid the emergency. And once they take this, then they don't need the emergency pill. Perfect. So, so yes, but it also depends upon how often they yeah, are sexually active. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's going to happen once in many months, then I have no problem with, with the emergency, emergency contraceptive. Yeah. And even there, you have to understand that in an entire month, she's going to be fertile for like three days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, she's not even, it may not even be those three days. Mm -hmm. But I would still say emergency contraception of irrespective then. And again, young girl, prote barrier protection, please. Absolutely. 
Yeah. I do get a lot of these young girls coming and yeah. sometimes I find a private moment to ask them whether they are sexually active. Mm. And if they are and they've come with obviously their mothers yeah. with with whatever other symptoms they have, I would definitely be more favorable to use the combined hormonal pill mm-hmm. for yeah. a proxy indication like PCOS and mm-hmm. her periods and tell her this is also going to help you here. Absolutely. But please do and protect yourself. So I think these young girls should be counseled. I do not want to create uh, any kind of a fear about emergency contraception. Yeah. I think it's fabulous. Mm-hmm. It's a great part of our armamentarium. At any point in time, it must be used if you feel that you are in that situation. But if you are in a relationship which requires you to be more safe, please get on to some other method of yeah. contraception. And that method has to come from a professional like you. That is something... Not advice from you, social you media. Approach, yeah. you, approach, you approach people. There are a lot of resources you can, you can actually have, but you approach people, good people, mm. uh, who will keep your confidence. Right. You have to find the provider who will do that for you and get the best possible advice. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you for saying that because the, these are questions that come with so much confusion. They don't get a direct answer and they're Googling and finding out and some of the stuff they've come back to us, us actually scares us with what they want to do. I just wanted to make a message out to young girls, you know, speak to your professionals, speak to your doctors. There are ways to do it the right way and you need to look after your health and your hormonal balance as well. So doctor, before we move on to puberty from oral contraceptives, we spoke about barrier protection, infection. What about oral sex? And I'm talking about both ways, you know, a man going down on a woman, a woman going down on a man. Can you talk about that infection, HPVs, everything that can happen if there is going to be this happen, basically? So I think it was the HIV, uh, call it a pandemic, that really brought the importance of safe sex to the fore Mm -hmm. and not just for preventing pregnancies but for preventing infections. Never before had we really been very active and serious about preventing infections Mm -hmm. and transmission through sex. And so safe sex thankfully is something that's now become something everyone knows about and Mm -hmm. almost routine and safe sex is the use of barriers. Mm There are two types of barriers. The one men use, that's condoms. And women have diaphragms, but unfortunately those don't give you the same kind of protection. There is a female condom. Never really caught on, Mm -hmm. but it is kind of a niche product where the woman inserts this protection and Mm -hmm. she's the one who kind of takes charge of her own barrier protection. Now people forget that uh, that there can be different variations as far as sex Mm -hmm. is concerned. And that's something that's a couple's choice. It's individual choice. I don't think anyone can judge and say uh, that something is normal and something is not normal. And safe sex has to be safe, whether it's vaginal sex or even oral sex. Mm -hmm. Uh, There have been cases, some very well-known cases, celebrities, where oral cancer was the result of HPV infection, Mm -hmm. which was acquired through oral sex. So first, If you're practicing safe sex, you practice safe oral sex by the use of condoms or barrier Mm -hmm. protection. Uh, When I first tell my patients this, they say, oh my God, is that why there are flavored condoms? And I say, of course, you have to understand that it's something that we are trying to do to make it safer for Mm -hmm. you. But people forget that women also need safety. Mm -hmm. And if, again, you need to be protective of of yourself, you can actually use something called as a vaginal dam, which could just be as simple as an opened out condom Mm -hmm. to protect the vagina from HPV infection happening through oral sex. So you have both protection for men and women, more for men Mm -hmm. than for women, because that's where the HPV spreads easily from. And I would tell anyone who is sexually active, you are important. Your partner is important, but at this point in time, you're not being selfish by being extra cautious and extra careful because the consequences, one, infection, that infection could could cause pelvic inflammatory disease, subfertility and a whole lot of complications, something like genital herpes Mm -hmm. or oral herpes, which is something that's going to keep coming at you 
throughout life, there'll be episodes which will resolve and keep coming back or something like HPV, mm -hmm. which is a virus that can in certain situations actually cause cancer in the woman, cervical and vaginal cancer and in the man oral cancer. Mm -hmm. Doctor, so I wanted to ask you, so considering safety first, I mean, that's the clear, clear message coming out for boys, girls, women, men. What if you're really in a stable relationship where you know, are there tests that, like, let's say there's me and potential partner B. We're in a relationship, we trust each other. Maybe we've had partners before, but now we're settling down. And we want to make a decision to practice safe sex without barriers for infection because we're committed to each other. Are there any tests that we can do to see yeah. that we don't carry these previous infections yeah. so that we can, you know, make a safe decision going forward? Yes. Mm -hmm. so, so firstly, if you are a couple that is in a stable relationship mm -hmm. and you can trust your partner with, with mm -hmm. your life and everything in it, yeah. that's the time you can afford to let your guard down. Mm -hmm. But what about having if your partner said, had a previous? Having said that, yeah. we often get we often get couples, mm -hmm. women, men, mm -hmm. who say that we are not going to get into this relationship, and we want to be sure that we are safe for each other. Yes, there are tests, and the tests primarily target infections such as chlamydia. Mm -hmm. There's a blood test, uh, herpes. Mm -hmm. There's a blood test. Uh, as far as HPV is concerned, there is a vaginal smear, mm -hmm. which is done along with the pap smear. Unfortunately, we don't have an HPV test for men. Okay. So we basically focus on the women. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I would do a test for hepatitis C, hepatitis B and HIV. Mm -hmm. And I think with these, you are pretty safe. Got it. Now, there are That's couples helpful. where one of these tests may turn out to be positive and they are still serious about their relationship with each other, well, they just need to be protected yeah. and protected. Mm -hmm. And they can live a perfectly normal, healthy life together without putting the partner at risk. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. So like we always say, there are foundations. Get the foundations right. And there's always a way that you can navigate through even yes. problems that we have in our relationship sexually. Doctor, I want to move straight into puberty. We were talking about this. You know, why are... <clears throat> a lot of young girls reaching puberty way before their time today. You know, I mean, from a world of nutrition, we see adulterated milk with excess estrogen. We see the food chain. I personally see sleep deprivation of young girls yeah. leading on a hormonal imbalance. I wanted to understand from your perspective, this early puberty, what are you seeing? Why is it happening? And is there any dangers of this happening too early in the entire life cycle of a woman? Yeah. So, so firstly, there is no doubt that puberty and menarche, that's the first mm -hmm. menstruation, are happening earlier, happening earlier. But here we are following the West and we are probably like 10 or 15 years behind them. Mm -hmm. So it was 12 to 14, then down to 12, then 11. And today the cutoff is taken as around 10. Though I must say a majority of girls will still reach menarche around 12. Mm -hmm. That means that they will start the changes of puberty at least two years earlier. Mm -hmm. Because that's right. when the whole process starts. Mm -hmm. You hit the nail on the head. We live in a messed up world. It starts off with what you have inadvertently. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, industry has its own goals, targets. And they're not very responsible always to public safety. Not mm -hmm. always. I'm not, I mean, today we have many, many ethical, high quality, you know, standards in industry, but not always. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to inject or feed livestock or dairy yeah. uh, mm -hmm. with, with whatever, it's going to find its way into mm -hmm. that child's body. And if it finds its way into the child's body, it's going to trigger certain changes. In our last episode, we spoke about yeah endocrine disruptors I mean, mm -hmm. that's something you can do today dear mm -hmm. viewer in your kitchens in your homes please read about endocrine disruptors there are some great champions out there who've been talking about them for a long time and see what you can get out very easily and very safely True. so that yeah. would make a difference now when do alarm bells start ringing if i have menarche that's the first menstruation before the age of 10 or the changes in the secondary sex characters before the age of eight, 
it's called precautious. Mm -hmm. Precautious means too early. Mm -hmm. And that's when you have a choice of doing nothing mm -hmm. and letting it go as it would or stepping in and trying to delay it a little bit. Yeah. So when I have a girl who's brought to me or to a doctor with early changes, and I think mothers, parents should be vigilant. Suppose your child has suddenly started a growth spurt. Suddenly mm -hmm. you're seeing a child of six or seven having pubic hair, axillary mm -hmm. hair. Maybe it's time for you to try and consult a doctor and tell whether it's all right. The doctor would probably do some hormonal tests, do an x-ray to look at the, 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 the joints, uh, the bones, mm -hmm. and see the bone age of the child. And you can actually delay mm -hmm. puberty and menarche by two or three years or four years with medication. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is a medication. Yes, you are actually suppressing a process which nature has already started. But I think we have enough experience with doing this safely. Mm -hmm. What are the benefits? The benefits are that you have this child who is living with all the peers who are way behind them. Mm -hmm. Once this time, uh, time happens, you know, the hormonal changes also bring about a certain change in this child's attitude and mm -hmm. behavior, which might stand out and be considered normal. And most importantly, once menarche happens, generally growth stops. So initially your child might be ahead of the peers in the class, but very soon the growth will stop mm -hmm. and they will continue to grow past and you'll always have less than what you would have other, otherwise had as your growth potential. Yeah. But this is a choice for parents to make along with an endocrinologist, pediatrician or gynecologist to make this decision. Having said that, if a child has the first period around 10, or 11, that's not technically considered abnormal. Mm -hmm. And we have a big responsibility as parents and caregivers and teachers to prepare this child for it. Mm -hmm. When do you have the conversation with your child? Well, I think you should start having this conversation with boys and girls when they get past the age of eight, come to nine mm -hmm. or 10, and prepare them for what's going to happen soon in their lives. Mm -hmm. There are strategies, there are ways, and we should never shy away from giving answers, shutting them up, you know, shutting them down. Mm -hmm. You could do it very, very, you know, easily. You could yeah. talk about, okay, you're going to change. This is what's going to happen to you. You're going to expect it. Mm -hmm. This is not something to be afraid of. And if you're a girl with secondary sex characters developed, even if it's, she's 10 and a half years old, the mother has to tell her that someday soon you're going to have your first period. Be prepared for it. Yeah. And it's the most normal thing to happen in a girl's life. It's beautiful, doctor. What I, I I love everything you spoke about, but I love about I love the fact that you spoke about educating boys yeah. about the same thing. I think that's such a brilliant, brilliant point you brought up. Young boys, because they don't know what's happening too. So for them, young boys, they'll be curious, they'll be wondering. You know how it is. But with education, they look at it very differently. I love that point. And I probably want to take that further to see how boys can be educated on this. You know, I think that's brilliant. So thank you for explaining that. Doctor, I want to get straight into cancer. Okay, do you believe that most cancers, I mean, now when we look at data today, 95 to 96% of cancers are lifestyle. The balance is highly genetic. Maybe, may not be prevented. I personally believe seeing so many cancer patients that a lot of them can be prevented. I would love for your thoughts and experience on cancer. And if you believe it can be prevented, what can we do and what are we not doing today that's bringing on so many endometrial and endometrial cancers, ER positives, ovarians. We're seeing it all the time. Like every day, we don't have less than two or three women with hormonally driven cancers and men as well. Yeah. You know, so I would love your thoughts on this. So, so I'll focus on cancers in women. Yes. And I'll say we have the greatest opportunity today because for a woman, a majority of her cancers come from four parts of her body. Uh, for the modern woman, breast cancer has taken number one mm -hmm. spot. Uh, till recently in our country, it was at number two or three. It's come to number one. More so in our urban population, which for good or bad tries to mimic everything the West does. Yeah. Uh, this is followed and it used to be followed by cervical cancer, which has kind of dropped to number four, but in our country still remains at two or three. Mm -hmm. 
endometrial cancer is coming up yeah. really fast mm -hmm. and then you've got ovarian cancer which is the one that we have the biggest problem with mm -hmm. because ovaries are so difficult to access and evaluate mm -hmm. so let's take breast cancer first Breast cancer is something that started happening in a big way when we changed. And we spoke earlier about women not menstruating that mm -hmm. much yeah. 100 years ago. Pregnancies protected women from breast cancer. Lactation protected women from breast cancer. So for a woman who has not lactated many times or not lactated at all, her risk goes up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Please understand that when you talk about medicine, yeah. you talk about evidence and statistics, and we don't want to create a fear. You Absolutely. don't have to lactate to prevent cancer, yeah. because a lot of my patients who have cancer have children, but mm -hmm. maybe they have one or two children. Mm -hmm. So that's, there is always a family history, but the family history is responsible for about 15%. Mm -hmm. So everyone, oh my God, I've got a history mm -hmm. of cancer in my family. Well, yes, but it would have to be a first degree relative a mother yeah. or a sister or a daughter and if it's a little further but it's always nice to know your family's history mm -hmm. to talk to your mother to talk to your aunts because if you have a family tree mm -hmm. which is showing me multiple cases of breast cancer or you or ovarian cancer mm -hmm. you need to be vigilant and since we are on this uh, you could do a genetic test mm -hmm. you could do a BRCA test and if you are positive mm -hmm. then Everyone knows about Angelina yeah. Jolie and what she did. Mm -hmm. And you you do whatever needs to be done for you. You don't have to follow the same. True. Yeah. Interestingly, everyone had an opinion on what she did. Yeah. And the funny thing is, hey, it was her breast. She yeah. lost a mother. It was her decision. Mm. And the most amazing thing is when the most beautiful woman in the world can do it and still look great, mm. women stop feeling stigmatized and embarrassed if you have to undergo surgery yeah. for breast cancer. Uh, other ways of preventing breast cancer, endocrine disruptors, mm. estrogen in the environment, mm -hmm. estrogen in what you're having, is it? Because a lot, lot of breast, breast cancer is hormonally driven and you mm. very rightly said there could be estrogen receptors positive, there could be progesterone receptors mm. positive and you could have it. Can we prevent breast cancer? If we completely changed our life, but that might not be easy. But what you can definitely do is you can pick it up at the earliest stages. Mm -hmm. If you are a woman, you have a responsibility to do a self breast examination. It's something you can do very easily once a month. Mm -hmm. You can't give yourself five or ten minutes. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you it's a lifesaver because I've had patients picking up things themselves. Mm -hmm. A periodic examination with whoever your healthcare provider is. It could be your GP. It could be your gynecologist. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll tell you what I do in my practice because there's a lot of confusion regarding mammograms. Mm. I normally would prefer my first mammogram somewhere when the woman is around 40. This mm. is a woman who doesn't have family history. That woman might start earlier. earlier yeah. And then if it's completely normal, the next might be after two or three years or four years. After 45, today the recommendation pretty much is do it annually. Mm -hmm. A mammogram picks up something before you can feel it. Mm -hmm. And it's usually also combined with ultrasound. Now women dread mammograms because they are painful. Well, yes and no. Today, the machines are much better. And, okay. you know, a little bit of pain to save a life, I think it's something worth doing for yourself. So if you do that and you pick up something earlier, don't hide it. Mm. You know, my biggest problem is sometimes a woman feels something and she's so afraid that it might be something bad, she'll just not talk about mm -hmm. it and she'll wait for it to go away. And I've always said, women, if the man had something, the woman in his, wife, in his life would rush him to a doctor that same evening. Yeah. When women have something, they'll procrastinate, mm -hmm. which is why very often women come late mm -hmm. when, when, it, when it is their problems. Coming to cervical cancer, yeah. the only preventable cancer mm -hmm. really is cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. You can prevent it. I'm not talking about picking it up early. Mm -hmm. And we've been able to prevent cervical cancer for the last 60 or 70 years. A simple pap smear, mm -hmm. which is a simple pickup or scraping of cells from the cervix, a small little internal examination, can pick up the cancer before it becomes a cancer. cancer. Mm -hmm. Because it goes through a series of precancerous changes to reach cancer. Just imagine, it's a disease continuum. If I can find it somewhere during the journey, I can stop it and stop it from reaching cancer. Mm. And then the Nobel Prize was awarded for the discovery that a virus caused cervical cancer, mm -hmm. the HPV virus. So now I have a test for HPV. 
there are there are 100 plus different strains of HPV of which about 9 or 10 are considered high risk and those, those are the ones that cause cancer. Mm -hmm. Now that we know that there is an HPV infection, I can do a smear, find out if she has HPV and today I do an HPV pap smears for every woman who's, who comes to me, everyone. Mm -hmm. I always am proud that we are a 100% HPV pap clinic. If she is normal, she doesn't need to do it each year. She can do it after five years. Seriously. But if yeah. she is abnormal, she goes under vigilance. No panic. Mm -hmm. Even if you are HPV positive, less than two or three percent will move towards cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. And then there's the vaccine. Yeah. We today have a vaccine, which initially was two strains. 16 and 18 are responsible for 80 percent. But today we have a nine strain vaccine, which is far superior. And this is a vaccine which can prevent HPV infection. And if I prevent HPV infection, I prevent pre-cancer. And if I prevent pre-cancer, I prevent cancer. Look at the opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's approved for use from the age of 11 to the age of 45. The earlier you give it, the better the girl responds. Mm -hmm. But never mind if you haven't taken it early. You can still do a catch-up later on. Thankfully, a lot of pediatricians are doing it today. And the advantage of doing it before the age of 15 for your daughter is that when you give her this vaccine now, the WHO says one dose is enough. Mm. And after the age of 15, so the recommendation still remains three doses, the WHO says two doses are enough. And I've completely shifted to the nine strain vaccine, though the four strain vaccine is still very much there. It's more affordable. And I believe our government is going to launch it in a big way and they will take the four, mm -hmm. four strain vaccine, which will cover 80%. Now comes the question and my patients were like very often, you're telling me to give a vaccine to my daughter. What about yeah. my son? Right. Tough one. But Australia started doing it for the boys as well as girls a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Some Western countries are doing it for both. Now, the reason why it is focused on girls is because girls have this problem with cervical cancer. But remember, we talked about oral cancer before. Yeah. HPV, you can actually prevent this with the vaccine as well. So it's protective uh, for guys as well. It's protective the, for boys. And, 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 and yeah. if I might be a little this out there, yeah. because I'm very pro-women and favor women. Yeah. That's where women get the HPV infections right. from. Yeah. So let's get it at the source. The problem is cost. And when there is an expense, you've got to focus your expense on the one who needs it more of the two. Mm -hmm. And of course, the second is is production and the amount that's available. If you suddenly started diverting the limited amount of HPV vaccine you have to both, yeah. then you might suddenly find shortages for the girls. For the girls yeah. But we've got to work this out. And I look to a utopian world where like all the other vaccines which are gender neutral, the HPV vaccine should be gender neutral as well. Everyone should get it. Right. If they haven't got it when they were in their adolescence, they can still take it. And while it's approved till 45 and a woman has every right to take it till 45, I personally, and this is only a personal opinion, feel that after the age of 35, close to 40, I don't think she will get the same benefit. Mm -hmm. And as long as she's do being safe with sex, as long as she's doing her pap smears regularly, she can still prevent cervical cancer. Is the age limit the same for the guys? Uh so what happens with this vaccine is mm -hmm. it's a lot more effective when it's given to younger populations Got it. and it's less genders. effective later. Mm -hmm. So your immunological response mm -hmm. later is not going to be as good. Right. So we, now it's been around for long enough. We did mm -hmm. this first when we didn't have the vaccine for five or 10 years. Today, we've had the vaccine for the last 25 years. There's no excuse for someone to not to get it early enough. In our practice, very often, again, I catch my patient uh, if she's come to me with the pregnancy six months post delivery. Mm -hmm. So by which time she's generally in a stable relationship, everything is fine, but you still want to be safe. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, Doctor. That's so much of information. Doctor, when you look at the world today, you know, you see so many young girls. Sorry. Yes. Endometrial cancer. Okay, let's go back. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> sure. Then mm -hmm. we come to uterine cancer. Yeah. It's just coming up in a very big yeah. way. And look, a lot of it is the issues that you deal with. Mm -hmm. Okay, PCOS, hormonal disturbances, excess estrogens, estrogens which are not balanced off by progesterone. So mm -hmm. those anovular cycles where she's not 
releasing an egg where she is not ovulating and two months, three months, four months before she gets her next period, the endometrium tends to overgrow and an overgrown endometrium can sometimes have changes which start off as precancerous and might develop into cancer. So PCOS have a higher incidence of uterine cancer or endometrial cancer if they are not taken care of. Endocrine disruptors, estrogens in our diet and environment do it. Obesity, higher risk. So we actually have a triad of obesity, hypertension and diabetes who have a higher risk of endometrial cancer. To detect endometrial cancer, we have to be vigilant. Any abnormal bleeding after menopause is unacceptable. Mm. Whether it's bleeding or spotting, a menopausal woman shouldn't be having postmenopausal bleeding. Every woman after a certain age should get an annual ultrasound, just as I spoke about the mammogram. Yeah. If the lining of her uterus is more than 5 millimeters, she needs to be investigated. Mm -hmm. No panic, investigation. Mm -hmm. Most cases, 95% will be normal, 5% may be abnormal, they need to be dealt with. And endometrial or uterine cancer can be prevented by the contraceptives we discussed earlier, particularly the progesterone containing or bearing contraceptives. Mm -hmm. And the intrauterine device that releases progesterone can actually reduce the risk or prevent endometrial wow. cancer. So again, you've got, even if you have the risk factors, if you do these things and, you know, before we started uh, this, this chat, you, you spoke to me about the fact that uh, someone spoke to you once about doing hysterectomies to prevent yes. this. I mean, that's ridiculous. Mm. It's an overkill. Mm. Uh, I don't think any person, man or woman, should lose a part of their body if they don't have yeah. to. Isn't vigilance better? Isn't contraception better? In fact, you've got a minimally invasive procedure where I can put in a telescope, remove the lining of the uterus down to the basal layer and put in a, it's a daycare. Isn't that better to talk about removing a uterus? And I feel nothing is more hurtful and insulting than telling someone, you don't need this organ anymore, let's get rid of it. Doctor, what I see is a lot of people come and say that, hey, Luke, you know, I was told that you had your kids. Are you going to have any more kids? No, just remove the whole Let's thing. Let's ask the husband the same question yeah. and ask him whether he needs his testicles anymore. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. You don't do surgeries because you don't need an organ anymore. We ne we've mm -hmm. never needed the appendix yeah. in our bodies. And once in a while, it's going to bother us. Mm -hmm. We don't go around taking everyone's appendix off. So, so women, be aware, mm -hmm. be careful, be vigilant. Have a program for yourself. Men, if you are listening here, take responsibility. She looks after your health. Mm -hmm. She makes sure that you get your annuals. Make sure that she gets her annuals. Oh, yeah. And how about celebrating a birthday month by taking her for her annual checkup after her birthday, not before, in the following <laughs> month. We don't have any bad reports in the month before her birthday. And just make yeah. it a part of your life. This is, this is what you're doing for her. Finally comes ovarian cancer. Now that's mm. the tough one. Mm -hmm. And I say it's the tough one because, first of all, the ovaries can manifest a variety of cancers. Mm -hmm. The uterus has endometrium, so it's usually an adenocarcinoma, mm -hmm. which is a certain kind of cancer. The cervix has squamous epithelium, so it's a squamous cell Some cancer. cancer yeah. Cervix responds better to radiation, uterus responds better to chemotherapy. But when it comes to the ovary, the ovary is everything. Mm -hmm. The ovary is what gives us eggs and babies. So the ovary can have epithelial cancer, it can have stromal cancer, mm -hmm. it can have germ cell cancer, all kinds of cancers. The problem with ovarian cancer is it's sitting right there and the moment it spreads, it spreads everywhere. Right. Endometrium gets held, breasts can be palpated, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the cervix, a pap smear can take care of. It's very difficult to access ovaries. So for ovaries, one is we need vigilance. Mm -hmm. And we need vigilance by any any changes in habits. I mean, people have often read about if you have any changes in your bowel movements, if you have any sudden distension, if you have a loss of weight, get it investigated. Mm -hmm. Periodic ultrasound. You might pick it up early. early. There are certain tumor markers which I know get done annually, uh, but they have never been really reliable for ovarian cancer. Can we prevent mm -hmm. ovarian cancer? <laughs> to some extent, you can. Firstly, if there's a family history, mm -hmm. more vigilance. If you're BRCA positive, 
more vigilance and maybe that's the only time I would say you may want to act upon it. If I had a patient with a very strong family history and she's come and she says, you know, doc, and she's been advised, get these ovaries out. That might be safer for her Makes sense. after a certain yeah. age. And and something very, very interesting came up. Uh, you know, a lot of women are used for their hygiene, use a lot of talcum powder. Mm -hmm. And there's a case in the US which has been mm -hmm. settled against the pharmaceutical company, mm -hmm. which was one of the largest manufacturers of talcum Absolutely. powder, because they never told women that there was research to show that if those particles of talcum powder get into the body, they can get to the ovaries and cause an increased incidence of ovarian cancer. Mm. So when it comes to hygiene, of course you have to be hygienic. Yeah. Try and be as natural as possible, but avoid this obsession with sprinkling yeah. talcum powder all over your body, particularly mm -hmm. around your genitals. Wow, oh, doctor, you know, since we were speaking about women, this is one more question that we get. Single women, okay, they don't wanna have families, they, so they will probably never breastfeed. They'll never go through pregnancies. Some of them have reached the age group of 45, 46, not interested in having a partner sexually. Is there a correlation between intercourse and the health of a woman's reproductive system? And if a woman is not, doesn't have a partner, they don't want to have a man in their life, would we encourage them to look at, you know, whether it's sex toys or masturbation to... I'll tell you where I come from. I had a woman who came, beautiful, ma I mean, in a marriage, UTIs, burning sensations, periods all over, put chucked by every doctor, came to us. And then finally I said, let's go down to the, you know, sex life, zero sex life. She felt undesired by her husband, all of that stuff. So I had a lady nutritionist with me and I said, can you explain to her how she should masturbate? She thought it was a taboo. She thought it was all of that stuff. So she took two, three days for her. And then this uh, lady nutritionist of mine got her to, masturbate within a week within a week we couldn't believe it every symptom disappeared which made me further research about the importance of intercourse for women so if a woman doesn't choose to want to have intercourse anymore is this in any way a problem or should she have a sexual release through yeah. masturbation? so first of all first yeah. of all i mean again boils down to individual choice yeah uh, our role has to be the fact that we support her, mm -hmm. but also give her the options that maybe she hasn't thought about. Okay. There is enough evidence to show that being sexually active leads to a healthier vaginal environment. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's enough evidence to show that, an interesting evidence to show from the West, that women, though society doesn't believe it, can be sexually active in their 60s, 70s and even their 80s. Mm -hmm. All sexual activity does not have to be conventional vaginal sex. A lot of it can be self-gratification. Got it. Mm -hmm. uh, not something that was spoken about a lot, something that women did discover themselves on occasion, but now thankfully it's, it's a lot more out there. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff available from some excellent educators who are today talking about yeah. sex and self-gratification. You know, we spoke about a book last time. Mm -hmm. So when we wrote that book, uh, my co-author Shonali first says that, should we write about sex? And I said, of course. And that's mm -hmm. one of our most important chapters. And in the chapter, we've told a lot of stories and I'd completely forgotten this particular story. And uh, she reminded me that it seems a friend of hers had come to me and she shared exactly the same experience with me and mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know, it seems I told her back then, many years ago, that maybe you should try using a vibrator mm -hmm. and it really worked for her. Mm -hmm. We have a amazing. chapter in that book written by Lisa yeah. Mangaldas, who's an amazing, who actually talks all about self-gratification. Mm -hmm. So it's an option if you mm -hmm. want to take it up. But there are other ways of maintaining vaginal health as well. Mm -hmm. And I've come now to the opinion that after a certain age, when a woman starts having vaginal symptoms, and these are symptoms you can't get away from, mm -hmm. your flushes will pass. Mm -hmm. You will learn to deal with your emotional situation. You will become smart with your skin and hair and that kind of dryness. But the vaginal dryness and atrophy, what we call as GSM, the genitourinary syndrome of menopause, will be something that will be progressive. Mm -hmm. The use of one, simple measures, probiotics, and today, just as you have intestinal probiotics, there are vaginal vagina probiotics, probiotics yeah. after lactobacilli are what keep the vagina mm -hmm. healthy. 
on occasion using a feminine wash. You don't mm -hmm. have to. Your vagina normally takes care of itself. So basically to maintain vaginal health, uh, the vaginal pH is always acidic. Mm -hmm. And to maintain a reasonably acidic pH, some women need to use a vaginal wash, which they can. But finally, I believe in these women, there's definitely a role for using vaginal estrogens. Mm -hmm. Now, vaginal estrogens are something that are directly applied in the vagina with an applicator. Extremely safe. Mm -hmm. Extremely safe. None of the concerns about cancer risk. None mm -hmm. of the concerns about risk of thromboembolism. And I am now convinced that a vaginal estrogen long term helps a woman like the person you described, yeah. not sexually active, doesn't want to be sexually active. There will be a lot of women who may not be comfortable yeah. with using something for self gratification. In this situation, using vaginal estrogens makes a world of a Beautiful. difference. Mm -hmm. And she can use it as long as she needs to, starting with maybe three times a week and then twice a week, maybe once a week. But the important thing I think in this, uh, this discussion is to make her realize that she doesn't have to suffer the dryness, the itching, the recurrent infections, the recurrent UTIs yeah. that would happen mm -hmm. if she didn't take care of herself. However, brilliant. Doctor, I know you need to go back to your patients before we end one last quick question. German measles and chicken pox. Can you tell me how important this is yes. for young girls or uh, women? People who have children may have missed it, but can they still take it right now and right. its connection with their health? Yeah. So firstly, I, I wish we live in a world where every woman, before she comes to a point when she thinks about a pregnancy, even if she's not thinking about a pregnancy, uh, gets advice to do things which will be safe for her in the future. Mm -hmm. We spoke about the HPV vaccine. A lot of your work is around lifestyle, health, mm -hmm. maintaining your weight, watching your BMI, going ahead. Close to pregnancy for me, I want her to be normal with a thyroid, mm -hmm. which is sometimes you... Unless you check it, you don't know no, it. Yeah. Uh, sugars, even if she's pre-diabetic or, or early diabetic, that can be corrected. And that's what we need to do. But there are a few things which make a dramatic difference. Now, there are two infections. In fact, when, when the first studies linked an infection with birth defects in a child, mm -hmm. it was rubella infection. Rubella is German measles, mm -hmm. an extremely mild infection. Most of the time, if rubella happens, you might not even label it or recognize it. Mm -hmm. But the kind of birth defects it causes from cataracts in the child to, to heart uh, conditions and cardiac abnormalities, completely preventable. Thankfully, now rubella is a part of the MMR vaccine, mm -hmm. which is given to children close to the age of one year. Uh, but there's still a large population of women out there who escaped the vaccine. Mm -hmm. So for God's sake, you can do a test, check your rubella antibodies and then take the vaccine. And if you take just one dose, you're protected for the rest of your life. life yeah. mm -hmm. uh, chicken pox or varicella is something that came in a little later. It's not a part of standard protocol, but for me it is. Because suddenly I found I wasn't finding women with, chick with rubella in pregnancy, but once in a while women were coming with chicken pox while they were pregnant. Again, a viral infection again can cause defects, again can cause a congenital syndrome where the child is born with symptoms of chicken pox, completely preventable. Mm -hmm. If you don't have antibodies, two doses taken six weeks apart will protect you for the rest of your life. And remember, chicken pox definitely is more harmful when it happens to an adult than to a child. And finally, to go with this, if any woman is even dreaming of a pregnancy anytime in future, Getting onto folic acid mm. is one of the best ways of preventing birth defects. Yeah. Folic acid supplementation today is something that has been the game changer. We used to have the commonest defects being defects of the skull and the spine. And they've completely been wiped out when women have taken folic acid. Mm. And I think don't even wait for a doctor to tell you that. If you are a, someone who's thinking of a pregnancy in the near future, 
since our country, unlike the West, does not fortify its flour mm -hmm. with folic acid, just take a folic acid tablet. Right. You cannot, you cannot do too much. A small tablet of folic acid is just fine, and it will give you tremendous benefits and safety when you do conceive. I know you're so so big on preconception and things that women should do before pregnancy. So. Thank you for sharing this. So if a woman hasn't got her German measles, if she never took it when she was a child or her chicken pox, this should be part of her planning. And of course, the folic acid that you yeah. speak about. Doctor, thank you so much. Before I let you go, you know, when you look at the world today, everything's changing in terms of women's health, you know, reproductive health. What are the top two or three or four lifestyle changes that you see that you know, like, if this patient has done this or does this, there can be a better outcome? What would you say that is today? So change is inevitable mm -hmm. and women have changed. And <clears throat> generally, I believe women have changed for the better. Mm -hmm. More confidence, <clears throat> more autonomy, more choices, uh, willing to exercise these in their own interest. So that, that's the great part. What is not so great is firstly, when it comes to their, their lifestyle, uh, when it comes to their diets, they have a lot of justifications for not doing things right. Mm. Uh, women, unlike men, are great at their professions, but also have to be great on their own domestic fronts. Mm. We are not in an ideal world where mm. both the genders share equally when it comes to that part of their yeah. life. So what happens is she neglects herself. Mm -hmm. She knows what she has to do, but most of the time she can't do it. She has no time to exercise. She eats whatever she can on the go and that itself becomes a bit of a problem. I've seen that happening in a big way where mm -hmm. the world has become much busier. And this has brought with it a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. And the stress also comes from expectations. And I believe expectations on women are very often unfair and much more than the expectations of men, or yeah. the, on, on men, particularly when it comes to the professional world. Mm -hmm. And this leads to stress and look, you know better than anyone yeah. what stress does to the adrenals and the cortisol mm -hmm. and we have to find ways of dealing with this. Yeah. So my message simply would be, you know, you have to take care of yourself. Yeah. If you want to take care of everything else, whether it be family, if there is one, whether it be your work where you want to be exceptional, you have to look after yourself. And you have to give yourself the time and space to, you know, wind down when you have to, mm -hmm. exercise when you have to, eat when you have to, and and things will only be better. Women are great at multitasking. Yeah, they are. Far better than men. Far better. Yeah. Great at multitasking. Mm -hmm. But sometimes they have to allow the multitasking also to be for their own benefit, benefit. which I sometimes find doesn't happen. But I can tell you one thing that, um, that, that when I look after women, I also realize that uh, sometimes they do tend to, you know, want to do something but don't get around to doing it. Mm -hmm. But when they finally do, they are unstoppable. Mm -hmm. And that's what they probably have to find. Find that one moment when they say, this is what I'm going to do. I'm not being selfish by doing this for myself. When I do this for myself, I may be a better partner. Yeah a better wife, a better mother, a better lover, a better daughter, a better someone at work, I'm telling you, that will be the difference that will completely change her life. Beautiful. Thank you so much, doctor. The women put yourself first. It's not being selfish. It is absolutely not being selfish. Dr. Nazar, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. No pleasure. I know we're going to see you for episode <laughs> three. I know that for sure, but thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you. you. Stay tuned for more. We're going to continue our journey learning, sharing, and evolving. <laughs>